We have two sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon for European time. So you are currently participating in the one in the morning. So for today, um, I will talk about, I will introduce you to our initiative briefly. And then after that, we will have presentations from Otavia, who is our communications officer at UNOSF. And then we will have Mr. Tamidayo Onyosun, who is the managing director of Space in Africa. And then we will have Mr. Torsten Kreening, who is publisher and COO of Space Watch Global. After that, we will have a round table and Q&A. So we would like to answer all the questions you have that you've written in the chat at this timing. So please make sure to put in any comments or any questions before we start the Q&A. And if you use any social media and you want to mention about this webinar, please use the hashtag access to space for all and mention us at at Mark UNOSA. In the afternoon, we will have these. If you're interested, please join in. Um, we will have the recordings as well on the website later, so please check that as well. So, um, I will briefly introduce you about the Access to Space for All initiative that our um, office is working on right now. But before I get into the initiative, I just want to talk about a few things about space. So as you can see, the 2019 global space economy at a glance was $366 billion, and it is expanding every year. This year, due to Corona, I'm not very sure how it would end up, but it is expanding these 10 years. And into in the 2040s, it is estimated to grow more than two times of this. So we can see that the economy is growing widely. Next, I also want to tell you that space is now affordable. I've given a few examples. So Mangalayan is the Mars orbiter mission that the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, has developed. And it's worth, um, the development was like $73 million. While the Hollywood movie, The Martian, it cost $108 million, which means that um, building a spacecraft is sometimes cheaper than a Hollywood movie. Chandrayaan-2 is another um, spacecraft from ISRO, and it is the second lunar exploration mission, and it was $142 million for the development. And for a large airplane, it's $150 million, so it's not that much of a difference. The last one is to have an amateur receiving station for a meteorological satellite. It's worth $85, and a movie ticket for two in Vienna is worth $20. So if you don't go to the movies four times, you will be able to get an amateur receiving station. So I think you can see that space is not that far. I mean, space is very affordable now. So the economy is growing and now it's becoming more and more affordable. Also in the social impacts, all these SDGs, the social development goals can be solved and improved using space technology um, regarding for example, no poverty, we can use satellite data to help with the agriculture and food security. Um, regarding quality education, um, communication satellites can help reach people that are not in urban areas, but to other areas as well. And it helps in gender equality because it helps girls that were not able to go to school. So in many ways, um, space technology helps the SDGs. So this is why we believe everyone should have access to space. Um, and this is an example of how space technology can help the sustainable development goals. Um, please look at our website for more on that. So as I said, everyone needs to have access to space for all, and that is why we have this initiative. The goal of the initiative is to provide research and orbital opportunities for all people to access space and ensure that benefits of space are truly accessible to all. What we mean is we uh, access, uh, we help in having access to unique and unique ground and space infrastructures, which will be normally too costly or non accessible to developed countries. So we help have access to all those unique facilities, which is free of charge when you go through our initiative. So I will explain a bit about the history. So our office started the program on space applications in 1971. And in the beginning, it was more of theoretical things, um, support through regional centers, fellowships, curriculas, workshops and trainings. 
of course, we did a bunch of dissemination of information. We built portals and things like that. But now through the Access to Space for All initiative, which we organized on, in 2018, we are doing more practical and hands-on things. Right now we have these programs under the Access to Space for All initiative. We have seven and it is organized under three tracks. Um, the blue ones are the active opportunities we have now. The red ones are the identified gaps and we are still working with new partners to build um, opportunities for everyone. As you can see, we have the hypergravity microgravity track. We have the satellite development track and the exploration track. So I'm going to give you some examples of the programs we have. First, under the hypergravity and microgravity track, we have a program called Hyperjets, which is in cooperation with the European Space Agency, ESA. Um, this provides hypergravity experiment series at the Large Diameter Centrifuge Facility at STEC in the Netherlands. Um, currently, we are preparing for the next rounds, and yep, we hope to open that soon. Next, we have the fellowship program for drop tests, which is um, in cooperation with DLR, the German Aerospace Agency, and also ZARM, the Center of Applied Science, Technology, and Microgravity. Here, we provide experiments at the Bremen drop tower. We are also preparing for the next rounds as well. Next, we have accessing space with the ISS Barzo Miller platform, which we are doing in collaboration with Airbus. Um, through this project, we can offer external payload experiments aboard the Airbus Bartolomeo on the ISS. Um, right now, we are currently running the selection process for the first round, and hopefully we will be able to open the second rounds next year. Next, we have the cooperation on the utilization of the China Space Station, which we are collaborating with China Manned Space Agency, CMS. In this program, we provide payload or facility experiments inside or outside the CSS. Right now, um, the first round winners have been chosen. They're doing their developments and we are um, considering the next rounds right now. Next, we have Sierra Nevada Corporation's Dream Chaser and it is in collaboration with Sierra Nevada. Um, we are still in discussion and we hope to open more opportunities with this soon. Next, we move to the satellite development track, which we have two programs currently. Um, the first one is the CubeSat deployment from ISS um, Kibo module called KiboCube, working on with JAXA, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. Um, this provides CubeSat development and deployment from educational or research institutions from developing countries. Um, we are preparing for the next round and hopefully we will be able to open the next round in December. So please make sure to check our websites for that. And last, we have the accessing space with Vegasi, which is in cooperation with Avio. And this also offers a CubeSat launch opportunity. This is a very new opportunity that we just opened applications in October and it is currently open for all. Um, the deadline is next April, April 4th. So if you are interested, please make sure to check our websites. Um, we have a webinar posted on it and we also have all the documents ready. So yeah, please make sure to check that. Um, I'm sorry I rushed through all the opportunities, but you can find all the information on our website, unusa.org. Also, I'm just going to give you an um, overview of the series of webinars we're doing for this initiative. Currently, you're joining the how to raise awareness and engagement about the audience, uh, engage the audience about your project one. And after that, we will have more about space law and regulations. We will have one which is called Ask a Winner, which we will bring in winners from all the different opportunities and they will help you and advise you on the projects. Um, we will have ones on AI and also we will have basics on space engineering as well. Also, we will have webinars dedicated to each program. So for drop tests, we are planning one on the 18th of November. Vega C, we will have another one in November. Um, the date is still to be decided. And Kibo Q, we will have one in December when we actually um, open the AO. Okay, so now I think we can finally get back into the contents of this webinar, which is 
talking about how to raise awareness and engage the audience about your project. Um, we just want to tell you why we are doing this in the first place. Um, in our opportunities, we will ask all of you to write an application form. And in that application form, we ask everyone to provide us with a communication plan on how to um, how you plan to do your communications about your project. And in this webinar, we want to make sure that we help you um, like plan how to plan your communications plan and how to do it effectively. So now we will have three speakers that will help you and advise you on how to make your communication plans. OK, so I think we're ready to move on to our speakers. First, I would like to introduce Otavia Pesque, who is the com communications officer of our office. Um, Otavia is currently leading the communication strategy at our office, where she oversees all outreach and media efforts, focusing on how space technology can help sustainable development. Otavia, you have the floor. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Azuki said, uh, if you win one of the opportunities with access to Space for All, I will be the person of reference with whom you will work on your communication strategy. And of course, you also need to prepare a communication strategy to apply to the opportunity in the first place. So let's see how to do that. I'm going to share my presentation. Just give me a second. And put it in presentation mode. Here we go. I hope you can see that. So how do we analyze through effective communication? First of all, why should you communicate about your project? Well, many people don't know why or how space affects their daily lives and your project um, help them, can help them also understand why space matters. You can also contribute to attracting other talented individuals to the opportunities of the role initiative and also to the space sector in general as winners or also as participants in the Access to Space for All initiative, you are an inspiration to young people worldwide who wish to pursue a career in space and in the STEM sectors. Also, I've seen, I've worked with winners of the Access to Space for All opportunities in the past and uh, some of the projects that we have seen have amazing value for their community and beyond. So it's really important that this value is properly communicated, that people know about your project and your research, which you may think that your research is niche or is um, maybe better understood only by professionals, in your, by space engineers or by um, people with advanced knowledge of your sector. But it's also very important to communicate um, why your project matters to the general public, to have support for your research, to have funding going forward, um, and to give back to the donors and partners of the initiative as well. Um, which tools should you use to communicate? We're going to look at some examples, which it depends on the audience that you're trying to reach. And I'm also going to talk about how we can help with that. So social media, as you might know, UNOSA has several social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube, mostly. Each of these has a slightly different format and audience. Some of you may be familiar with that. You can easily reach thousands of followers. For example, our Twitter account has over 24,000 followers, our Facebook over 21,000, and so on. And you can reach out to me at any time during your uh, project, not just when you complete it, but also when you reach any milestone to prepare social media messaging on our channels and share it about your project. We have many followers from space agencies, academic institutions, leading academic institutions around the world, the space industry, the UN system. So it's a very easy and effective channel. We can also prepare a press release, which we circulate through the UN system in Vienna. It is circulated to around 300 journalists who cover science, space, and the UN more in general, as well as the diplomatic community in Vienna, so United Nations member states. Usually we always issue a press release when we launch a new opportunity under the initiative, when we select a winner, um, yeah, and we generally like to include quotes from the winning team so that they can hear your voice and why you're doing um, the project. 
We also run website stories, so on our Reunosa website, about uh, your projects. I'm currently producing a few of these. So what we do is I interview the winning team and we discuss together for about an hour. And then I write up your stories and I exchange with you on the drafting. And then we post it on the website. So And we reference it in social media, etc. So that people can um, look up and read about what you're doing. You can also consider creating a project website. This is something that I would strongly advise doing. Some of our past winners have done so. So they have created either a blog or um, a website where people, for example, can download data from their satellite or follow this project step by step with images, with video, with, um, with uh, written reports about how the project is going. It's really useful to have the, all this information in one place. And I think it will be also useful reference for the future. Whenever in your career you you talk about this project, it will be good to have this resource with everything collected together. You can also reach out to journalists and we have the other speakers in our webinar today, I think will tell you more about that, how to pitch your stories to media covering the space sector. It's really important that you, uh, you get some media coverage for your story. Um, and you can also organize a webinar through us. So similar to what we are doing today, we can help you prepare an event online, inviting our people from our network to whom you can present your project. And this can also be recorded like we're doing today so that you have it for future reference. Um, what is the project to create a strategic communication product? Here I put together some of the steps that one needs to consider when creating a communication strategy. So this will help you also to prepare this part of your application. You should think about, first of all, what is your goal? What are you, are you trying to achieve with this communication? Do you want, for example, to get funding, to expand knowledge about the importance of your research, or just to win the application process? Who are you trying to reach and in which language? So, for example, on social media, we, we, we're not restricted to English. We can also use different languages. It depends who you're trying to reach. Seizing trends and opportunities. This is very important. We're, to, we're going to talk about this also later, that you, you look at what is going on in the world and in the space sector around you and try to connect your project to these trends and to topics that people are interested in. I'm going to expand more on this in the coming slides. You should also identify partners, for example, influencers or um, any space sector leader or colleague that you know can help you amplify the message. For example, from the simplest move of retweeting you on or retweeting your post on Twitter to helping you reach out to a media outlet. Um, any support is good to amplify your message. Which content can work best? Should I focus on fact? Should I focus on the human aspect of a story? I think usually the best answer is both. Um, but remember that I think the human interest aspect of a story, so telling how you learn about the opportunity, how this opportunity changed your career, um, how is it going to help people who are the ultimate beneficiaries of your project, this is very important to attract the reader's attention. How to distribute this product? Which format should you use? So, for example, among the ones we discussed before, press release, website story, blog, social media. And then it's really important to monitor and learn from what you did. So did my communication strategy work? What did I achieve? What could have been better? I'm going to give you some tips on social media now, a few very basic things that you can keep in mind. It's important to always tag the partners and organizations that you're working in with or mentioning if they have a social media account, because this way they will see your post and they can replicate it in their network and amplify your message. It's also good to use hashtags for popular terms in your post, for example, space, technology, earth observation. This will help you people who are interested in these topics find your post. Um, and also add links whenever possible that people can click in. So if you're preparing a post on Facebook, it's good to add a link to your uh, project website, for example, that people can click on to learn more. We have some hashtags that are quite established by now, focus on the Access to Space for All initiative. 
you can see them here. And also for some of the specific projects under the initiative, some of the more established ones, such as Kibo Cube, they have their own hashtag. And we're hoping to develop hashtags for the other opportunities too. Whenever possible, as I said, try to connect your content to topics that are of general interest or even that are trending on that day. This really helps your content pop up on social media. For example, international days are a good strategy. There, there is an, a calendar of international days that you can find on the, um, on the United Nations. Just Google it and you will see it. Some, some days that can be easily connected to your projects are International Day of Human Space Flight, which is every day in April. Day of Women and Girls in Science, which is on the 11th of February every year. So making the link between your project and these days can help your content trend on social media because these topics are going to be high up during, on that day, on the day when they're actually celebrated. Um, yeah, it's also important to use clear and simple language on your social media. So I know that most of your projects are really technologically complex and uh, not everyone can grasp what you're doing, but at the same time, you should strive to make everyone understand what is the goal of your project, why it matters. So you should try to find the balance between targeting the very professional audience that you have for your projects, such as, I don't know, academics, academia or the space industry, but also making sure that everyone understands why it matters. These are some examples of the posts that have trended more on our social media uh, related to access to space for all. So the first one, for example, announces the winners of our drop test fellowship to perform microgravity research at the Bremen drop tower. And the second one announces the winner of the hypergas fellowship to conduct hypergravity experiments at ESA. Uh, why did this work in particular? Why did they have so many impressions? I think because the content was clear, it was exciting because it was the announcement of a winner. And there was also, uh, in the second case, for example, a link to a press release where people can learn more about that. Um, and some details on why, what is their project about. Um, for example, the first one is about 3D printing under microgravity conditions. So that's really interesting. Uh, why it matters. These are a couple of more examples. So the first one announced that Kenya was able to deploy their first satellite ever through the Kibo Cube program and then was followed by Guatemala this year. Very exciting news. And the second one is announcing the opportunity with Avio that we just launched to have a CubeSat launched through Avio. It's, you, it's good to use images in uh, social media posts. It really helps to attract attention to your posts. So always try to include some images from your lab, from your team, from your university, from your country, anything. Um, it really helps the post pop up. Um, it's also important that you capture your story during the journey. So do not wait until you complete the project because before collecting the material. It's good to have material as you go along, because this will be useful later, such as pictures of the team, of any relevant moments in the lab, but also of your day-to-day -day work. Videos, if possible, are good, um, can be used later on. Keeping a diary of your projects, you can do that on as a blog, as an Instagram story, there are many possible formats. Do reach out to us, we can help you um, discuss the possible formats and promote any milestones that you reach. It's also important to organize outreach activities in your own community. So, for example, university lectures, inviting local students to visit your labs, um, publishing updates about your work. And again, use, use visual elements such as pictures to, um, to go together with this material to help you attract attention. So some general tips on communication strategy. It's always good to focus on positive and human angles, as we already touched upon. People, especially at the moment, are overwhelmed uh, and feel impotent in front of negative news. Your projects are a positive, winning um, news. It, it helps to bring something positive and exciting in the world of space research, tech and exploration, and to inspire others. It's also important that you add a personal touch. That's what I mean with make it real there. So share your own experience. How did you feel achieving this, winning this opportunity? How did this change your life or your career? 
and how does it affect your country's space sector? Also quotes from your team are good to include. Also really important, try to include actions that people can take to make a difference. So how can people interact with your project? For example, access data from your satellite or check out your website page, become a partner for the initiative, visit our project site, attend the lecture and so on. After people read your content, they're going to think, how can I interact with this? How can I get involved? And so it's really important that you provide options like this. And again, try to involve your local community in that. And lastly, I just wanted to give you some findings from the UN 75 survey. This is a survey that the UN did on the occasion of its 75th anniversary, which was, was, which was just a few days ago. So it asked 100,000 people around the world what their priorities are. Their immediate priority that popped out the most is improved access to basic services such as healthcare, safe water, sanitation, and education. And this was followed by greater international solidarity and increased support to those hardest hit. Also, the main concerns that popped up were the climate crisis and the destruction of our natural environment. So these are the topics that people around the world have in their mind, that they're most concerned about. So always try to think how your research project fit with these priorities. Do you contribute to any of these priorities? If you're able to make that link, that will make your message much more powerful. Okay, I've reached the end of my presentation and I look forward to answering any questions you may have in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Octavia. I think there was a lot of information and tips on how to do it effectively. And if anyone has comments or questions, please make sure to write it in the chat. Thank you so much, Octavia. I hope this helps um, everyone engage with our office more as well. Okay, next, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Temi da Dayo Onyosun, Managing Director of Space in Africa. Um, Temi Dayo is the Managing Director and the Authority, um, uh, sorry, the Managing Director of Space in Africa, which is the Authority on News, Data and Market Anal Analysis for the African space and satellite industry. He advises governments and commercial players in the African space industry value chain. Okay, Tamida, you have the floor. I will share your presentation right now. So hold on a bit. Thank you very much, Tamida. Um, hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Um, I'll briefly be talking about uh, how to engage the public in the project, um, whether it's a satellite project or you know any of the projects in the um, in the Access for Space program. Um, uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start with a few important questions that you need to answer. Uh, the first is, what stories do you actually want to tell? Um, so you've gotten um, into maybe the Kibo-Q program, for example, and now you have the opportunity to launch maybe your first uh, nano satellite. Uh, what story do you want to tell the public? Um, do you want to tell the story of you know, how your country is joining the space race or how your institution is leading your country's involvement um, you know, in the space industry? Uh, or do you want to tell the story of how you are trying to use, um, you know, satellite technologies to solve maybe developmental challenges in your country. Uh, so this is important. You need to figure out how, what story you actually want to tell. Um, and then next, you need to think about who is going to be in the center of the stories. Um, so um, do you want the institution that is, you know, submitting application for this program to be at the center of the story? Uh, you, you know, let, let's assume it's a university institution. Do you want the university to be at the center of the story? Uh, or do you want maybe a minister in the country? Uh, or do you want the engineers that are working on this project to be at the center of the story? Um, so this is an important question you need to answer. Then who will be speaking to the public, uh, you know, granting interviews on the project? Um, if you get, um, if you win any of these uh, opportunities, you will be getting a lot of, uh, you know, media requests, um, interviews, and all of that. So you need to 
figure out who will be speaking to the media, who will be answering interview questions, and all of that. Um, you know, different countries with different policies. Uh, there are some government institutions where, uh, you know, people are not allowed to talk to the media, but, you know, the media is going to want to talk to you. So you have to figure out who is in the best position to be granted these interviews. Uh, then next, how much of the project details do you want to share with the public? Um, when people are interviewing you, they want to know every single details about the project. You know, where the funding is coming from, the technical details, who are always involved in the project, um, you know, what the future plans are and all of that. Uh, so you need to, uh, you know, to decide how much details you want to share with the public. Um, you know, the more the better. Um, it, 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 personally, I love stories where, uh, you know, every details of the project is shared so that the public can actually get a better understanding of um, of the project. Then who are the media companies you want to work with? Uh, you know, we have industry-based media companies, like uh, media companies that focus specifically on the space and satellite industry. Uh, you know, com uh, media companies like Sat News, like Space Watch, like Room, um, and the likes. Uh, so who and who do you want to work with? Uh, a lot of them are very open, and, you know, if you share press release with them, uh, they will definitely publish if you, uh, you know, if you reach out to them to maybe help you promote your, um, your project or, you know, for interview opportunities, they're going to, uh, you know, be open to you. So you need to figure out who are the companies that you want to work with. And then they are national based companies. So if you're working on your country's for satellite, um, a lot of the local media companies would want to get information about the project. Because uh, it is good for the image of the country. So, which of these companies do you want to work with? And there are also regional and you know global um, media companies. So you need to answer this important question. Then, what platform do you want to use to speak to the public? Uh, you know, do you just want to do uh, maybe article-based interviews? Do you want to do radio? Do you want to do TV? Uh, do you want to have a project website where people can come and? get all the details about your project um or do you just you know do you not want all of that do you just uh you know want the only thing you give the public to be the only information about your project or do you also want to you know by the time you get a lot of you know media attention you could actually develop some sort of wikipedia page for your project uh you know that's also one of the ways to um, you know, share details about your projects before. So you need to, uh, you know, answer this important question. Uh, and lastly, how do you want to receive feedback on the project? Um, so if you're granting a lot of interviews, talking to the media and all of that, um, you know, people will want to ask you questions. Uh, maybe questions put in the, uh, in the interviews. People will want to know whether you're open to collaborations, partnership, People want to follow up on your project. Maybe they're interested in it and, you know, they're thinking maybe for a next project they should work with you. Uh, or people might want to give you feedback on, on your project. How do you want to receive this? Um, so do you want to engage the public via Twitter? Uh, or do you, um, you know, just want to have a project website where there's like the contacts from uh, and then there is a walk-in email um, that people can, um, that people can reach out to you on. Uh, so these are very important questions that we need to answer. Next slide, please. Then in raising awareness for a project, these are like four important um, strategies that you need to pay attention to. The message, the strategy, the audience, and, and time. Message, what message do you want to put uh, to the public? And, you know, when I say the public, there are like, you know, categories of um, of audiences for this, you know, there is, do you, you know, there are people working in the space industry who are like, you know, potential partners and collaborators, um, you know, what message do you want to pass across to these people? Uh, you know, the people in your country, uh, what message do you want to pass across them? For example, if you're from a third world country where um, you know, space is seen as a luxury. 
uh, what message do you want to pass to president? If it's a project being funded by the government, um, you want to be um, careful so that people don't think this is just one of the ways to waste taxpayers' money. So you need to be sure of the uh, of the mod message you want to pass across to the audience and you know the global audience. What what message do you want to show? You know from your country to the global audience. Uh, so this is very important. And what strategy do you want to use? As I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of the industry-based media companies would be very happy to work with you. Um, and timing is also very important. Uh, um, Otavio was showing some um, some tweet impressions. You know, timing is important on whatever you're throwing to the public. There are, uh, there are times you make a particular tweet and you know, you get a lot of impression on it. And you can make the same tweet at another time and uh, you won't get the kind of engagement that you want. So uh, you want to be sure that the timing of all of your uh, public engagement is um, is very appropriate so that you can get like maximum um, impression on them. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'll be happy to answer any of the questions on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Timidayo. That was a lot of really great information about important questions you need to ask yourself and also about the key components for raising awareness campaigns. And if there's any questions or comments to Timidayo, please make sure to write it in the chat. And also to the people who just joined, um, please make sure to write the country of your origin, where you're from, in the chat so that we can have a little survey at the end. Thank you so much, Temi Dayo. Next, I would like to introduce you to our final speaker, who is Torsten Kreening. Torsten is co-founder, COO, and publisher of Spacewatch Global. His decades of experience in the space sector and broadcast industry range from PT scientists, the private German mission to the moon, SCS, Lucent Digital Video, Bertelsmann, Freecom to IBM. He is based in Berlin, a proud grandfather and a motivated long distance runner, even not a good one, is what it says in the bio, but I totally doubt that. I think you're a very good runner, but I don't know. Um, yeah, you have the floor now, Torsten. Great. Thank you very much our, um, for your nice words and thank you very much for Otavio and our Timmy Dayu also for uh, your presentation. I try to keep that uh, as short as possible. Uh, I'm Thorsten Greening, the co-founder, uh, COO, uh, publisher of uh, Spacewatch.global. Um, I would like to talk about trusted information and the value of outreach for you. Um, I can show you, you all are doing more complicated engineering things than we do. Um, what you do is rocket science media marketing branding it's not um, i will also talk about what media companies can do for you and how we can help you so let me see here yeah we are a switzerland based or uh, online platform for information in and about our space and new space activities in a geopolitical context so the SOAR group if you came across that is our legal entity and we are operating our, for over five years now in the market. Our, on our website, we have over four and a half thousand or four thousand two hundred pieces of content, are, and so on. We are based our values purely on Swiss neutrality, and everyone working with us are, in our international team has to sign and to fulfill the code of ethics for journalism. Why is that important? We are an independent voice for global space. We can be your reference. Um, there's a lot of information are in the in the market. As the market becomes interesting, all the information flood in and people make something out of that. And we try to keep it as relevant as possible and as um, trustworthy as possible. So to go forward, um, our access are to the website and to all the information is free for all. So there's no subscription required. Um, with that, we are also compliant for the SDG number four, equal education, because we believe that only our trusted information accessible to everyone can help 
all of us in the industry and respectively then also you with your project and with your information. I will talk about this our portfolio in a bit. Um, I know many of you are already familiar with our website, uh, with our bi-weekly or daily newsletters, our Space Cafe uh, web talks um, and our Space Cafe podcast. I mean, just to mention um, the latest episode in our podcast was released yesterday and featured a space philosopher, Professor Jim Schwartz. Um, it's a pretty cool podcast, I would say, and worth listening. But uh, also we are opened on an online fan shop uh, for you or where you, of course, and also can support us to become a space watcher. All our events, our previous events, space cafes, we have an archive available on the website and in the event section and on YouTube. I mean, just to jump to summarize, we can help you with marketing, with outreach on our channels. So you can concentrate on your cool space project, on your work. But very important, and uh, it was said by all the previous uh, speakers as well, sooner or later, when you grow, you need your own marketing team in your entity. Um, and you heard about these needs or previously. So what we can do, and all of us, Timidayo, our team, we can help on your way to reach this stage because most of you, if you if you raised our funds, you will spend your money on engineering and, and all this stuff you in your project, but not necessarily on the outreach part. But it is super important doing good and talk about it, as we say. So um, just to run through a few formats that might be interesting for you on your way, wherever you are right now in 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 your in your stage. But these are free events that we run on our, our recurring base are to engage with the audience, to educate the audience and to provide different views. Here, for instance, you see our two our special formats, space, space cafes of our space cafes. One is a Black Ops by Ralph Thieler uh, on 12th of November. And that's the first session where we talk only about military applications in Leo Mio with our guests. And the other one is a space cafe with Professor um, Moriba Jam called Moriba's Vox Populi. And the second uh, session we plan for the 3rd of December. And he is a big advocate um, on space or environmentalism and space situational awareness. So, and our Another slide here on our next web talks that you see um, what we are covering yesterday. Um, I had a web talk with Dr. Malcolm Davis from Australia. Um, I mean, he, he got up at uh, two in the morning in Australia to, to give uh, this uh, web talk and it was very impressive. So next week on, on Tuesday, uh, and it's always at 4 p.m. or uh, Central European time, we have Chris Dott from Mansart, a week later, Ole Docker from Spaceport Norway, and then on the 17th of November, Mari Eltom are uh, from Norway talking about our space ambitions from oil to orbit. So all these events you can also find on Eventbrite. So, but the big question is, how can we help you? And how can you get in touch with us? It's very easy. Just send us an email or um, send us a message on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on whatever channel you prefer. If you want to reach out to us, you can do that. And then we will or we will talk to you. So you can send in your article, even your draft, and we can help you to turn it into a proper news feed. But if you send it over, there's no guarantee that we will place it because that's the, where the independence com comes in. So we want to hear what is behind it and we want to see uh, to the bottom of what you guys are do. And that's from my end. Don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. I'm open to any of your questions. Thank you so much, Torsten. Thank you for all the information about how to engage with Space Watch. And now that we have a few questions coming in, I think I'll jump into the Q&A now. Okay, so um, I guess the first question is from Jorge, our colleague, to Timidayo. So 
Thanks a lot for the tips. How you select the timing? Let's see. Someone in South Africa wants to get the highest number of impressions. What would be your recommendation concerning the timing? So, Timmy Dio, if you can, yeah, answer that for us. Okay. Um, yeah. So you you have to consider a few things. Um, number one is who are you trying to reach? So let's say you're trying to get, um, you know, maybe the global uh, space industry attention for whatever you're trying to do. Then you need to consider, you know, the timing. So look at the time zone in South Africa compared to like the time zone in other part of the world, uh, because you might end up taking something. A lot of the people you want to see those things are actually sleeping. So you consider the time. Well, let me give you an example. So in space in Africa, uh, we noticed that, so we're based in Lagos, Nigeria. And we noticed that we actually get, you know, more impressions at night uh, than in the morning. So Nigerian time in the night, we get better impressions. Uh, more people, you know, interact with our tweets and all of that compared to when we tweet in the morning. Um, so you need to look at uh, the time zone of those people that, are, that you're trying to reach um, and whether they will be awake when you're tweeting, whether they will be at work or whether they will relax and be able to enjoy with you. The second thing is uh, you also need to look at what is currently trending. Um, so, okay, you're from South Africa. So maybe there's like some sort of local stories in South Africa that is, you know, taking the entire country by storm. Uh, you might not want to like, you know, engage people at that period because they are currently focused on that thing. So you might want to, um, you know, calm down and maybe tweet at a time when, um, you know, there are no distractions to people. Um, yeah, I hope this helps. Thank you, Timidayo. Um, Torsten, you're on the media side as well. Do you have any tips on um, the timing of articles? Because I know you mentioned that we can just send you emails and you'll choose, but yeah, is there anything that you have for tips regarding timing? No, um, there is no ideal timing or in, in, in my opinion or um, you when if you would do it in a proper way you would start with thinking about the media planning for um for your for your campaign or your outreach i mean just to tweet what you're doing or is fine but or um, i mean that's that's not really a kind of, of of media so what we do is i mean we are not going for the for the breaking news for instance so we take stories in and check is there a time timely reference to that is it is it interesting for our potential readers that's also from our point of view who are our readers so we define our target audience i mean these are these this is a question you have to answer to whom you want to address your project so who do you want to make aware is it our a potential client is it a potential investor so and that's always the, the question of why so and within this set of questions, there's also then one element is the, the timing. I mean, if you're heading for your company or into an IPO, um, you don't want to disclose information before or a certain period of time. Um, you, do, you don't want to talk about your, your secrets or before they are revealed. All, all of that um, comes into the equation. So. It's a hard question to say what is the perfect timing, and I don't believe there is any. Um, I don't know if that helps, <laughs> but it's at least tr tr truly. If I can add something to yeah, what, uh, yeah. what Orson just said, um, regarding social media, you might want to do some research on about where your audience is based. So, for example, for the question that we were asked, if you're in South Africa, it doesn't necessarily mean that your social media following is also in South Africa. And I'm saying this because, for example, with the Unosa channel channels, we have a lot of audience in the Americas. So if I post something during the European working times, uh, it might not be the best timing to reach this audience. So you also need to consider that it's really easy to see this uh, data through Twitter analytics, for example, or through Google analytics. So it's something that you may want to do a quick check on to see where the people who follow you are based. And I see another question in the chat asking how much lead time is needed to approach a media, including UNOSA. So, 
to get a story online. Let me just answer that from the UNOSA perspective. So to prepare a story for our website, I would suggest a couple of weeks or two to three weeks in advance so that we can work together to prepare. I see Thorsten saying that that's a lot of time. Um, uh, yeah, let's say ideally two weeks, but we can do it in less. But to prepare a really good story, to select the pictures, the caption, the text, and really to refine together, I think two weeks would be ideal. But if you, if it's tighter than that, of course, we can try to make it happen. And for social media, well, we just need a few hours to put something out together. So um, on my side. Just to answer this question about our, how much lead time is, is needed, if you have a good story uh, and you want to share, the, um, let's say you have a prepared press release um, already, um, then a day in advance would be ideal. That's what I would would say. Uh, I mean, you can put it under an embargo. That is that is that is fine for most media, um, but our, for news items, th we don't have the luxury to work with weeks in advance. Or for features or opinion or in deep research papers, that is a different story. Um, but that there's no time um, component. With it. Thank you, Torsten. Um, Temi do you have any comments regarding the timing, um, the lead time that you need for your African news um, space? Or yeah, I, I think our our point is similar to what Torsten just said. Um, if, we, if it's a press release, you can share that 24 hours. You can put embargo on it. Uh, if it's a well detailed um, if you already have your material, then, you know, a day, two days. Um, but, you know, if it's a week where we, we have, like, a lot of stories, you might have to, like, push it in the following week or something. Uh, but I would say generally, um, for, a, for a detailed story where you have your material, uh, 24 hours is enough. Thank you, Tamidayo. And we have more questions to you as well. Um, how do you select a story? Let's say I have a project in Africa that I would like to be featured. What would you need? This is a question from Iban. Okay, uh, so first of all, we, we don't collect money for any story. Uh, our stories on our platform are free. Um, and because we focus on Africa, so your story has to be, uh, it's either you're like an African-based institution uh, if you're a foreign based institution, if your project has been implemented in Africa, um, we are happy to publish that. We uh, so so far your story has like an African element. Uh, we're happy to publish that for you. Um, and you know, I mean, it's gonna go through you know structured editing and all of that. Um, but yeah, that that's just about it. So far, your story has an African. Um, African notes to it. We were glad to publish that. Thank you, Tamidayo. Um, Torsten, is there a criteria that you have to select your stories to be featured in Spacewatch Global, or um, is there anything they need to prepare before beforehand, or any tips? That's a, that's a good point. Um, I think it's or for us it's very important that there is a substance in the in the story. Uh, if somebody um, sends us uh, or one milestone that might be important for for this project, that doesn't make a, a good story. Um, I mean, let's uh, I'll take a few examples. Or I mean, our Exo Launch or released a few. Um, um, press releases uh, recently, uh, which have really a rele relevance because they went into our, our, our contract or engagements with, with SpaceX. So, uh, and to, to integrate our, um, our ride share agreements or on, on, on Falcons. So that is absolutely relevant thing for the, for the market and for us and has a, a geopolitical component in it. So, and, um, that is something we have to judge, what every media has to judge. Um, we have a limit of five news items that we place a day on our website or during the work week. So um, that's, that's a limiter. 
So um, at the moment we are doing okay, or so we don't have to reject too many um, stories. Um, also, for us, for what we want to achieve is we want to cover a global emerging space market. So a story from, let's say, um, just a random country, Nepal, has for us a much higher value than just another rocket launch from the US. Because that's covered everywhere else. And we would like to focus on those voices that aren't heard too often. So that's uh, also some internal parameter what uh, what we have. So our, it can be a CubeSat or from uh, from a country that doesn't have an active uh, program, and that goes, I think, in line with what was what you guys at uh, UNOSA are promoting. Our, um, access for all, and uh, that's something what we support. So we we try to balance these these kind of stories. So, but um, I just want to encourage all of you to just give it a try. Send us your story over and and experience how the cooperation with media can look like. Thanks, Torsten. To add that, like um, to add a question to that, are there any like visuals, videos, pictures, or something that can help make the story a hit? Um, is it just sending a few paragraphs about the story? Like, it, is it better to send you pictures and videos? I don't know. Is there any plus way that um, the people can engage with you to bring mm. you stories? Or no, I mean our. Uh, Pictures are absolutely needed um, for for every story. Video is fine; it's it's a it's a plus, but pictures are absolutely needed. I mean, our, we are using a, a WordPress installation for uh, our platform, and you can't um, place stories there without a picture. Sure, you can use a ram random one or just another Earth picture. Um, but it should be relevant to the story. And or as the saying goes, a picture says more than 1,000 words. That's also very important. Thank you. About the pictures, I want to actually ask them to tell me, Torsten and Otavia. Um, you know, there's pictures of launch vehicles, the vehicle actually. Or is it interesting to have a picture of the team or when it's actually in development? Or are there any types of specific pictures or things that actually help boost the engagement? Or yeah, if there's any tips on that, that would be great. Yeah, I, I think aside pictures, uh, infographics are very good and useful. Um, so if whatever information you're trying to put out, if there are ways to, um, to use infographics to represent the information, uh, we, we actually prefer that because it makes it easier for the readers also. Um, regarding pictures, yes, high quality pictures. Um, you know, you can tell the story of your project with pictures. So if you can do that, then you can share a lot of pictures with us. Uh, you know, that would even make it better. Uh, for, for example, we also publish on, uh, you know, we share our stories on Instagram. Uh, we use like you know Facebook or Instagram stories, not Instagram stories. Um, and you know if you're trying to promote your projects using all of that channels, uh, you use pictures, uh, you know rather than text. So yeah, high quality pictures of you know every faces of the project is possible. And if I may add to that, I would say having a mix of the um, a technical picture, let's say of the vehicle and one of the team is always good. So you can have more than one, try to have a balance. And another thing that I wanted to mention is you may want to highlight inclusiveness. If you have anything to add from your work, for example, if you have women in your team, if you have young people in your team, these are categories that are a bit less represented in the space sector in general. So having a picture of your team that shows that you have some gender balance in there, for example, is a great way to um, to promote your project. So you may also want to consider that aspect. Thank you. And maybe about the gender perspective for Temidayo and Torsten, 
Um, do those um, factors interest you as well? As, as the UN, we always want to make sure that inclusivity is one of our essential points, but is it relevant for you on the news side, the media side as well? Um, absolutely. I mean, um, it is, I mean, for us evident are uh, that we try to, I mean, let's take the events or the space cafes, we try to balance our, um, or have a good balance between uh, women and men. Um, Sure, not every time you can have both genders are in in, in the talks, are, but we try to balance as, as best as possible. Also on our podcast, we have a good mix are, of gender of old and young people. Um, so um, as when it comes to the news, I don't see an, a gender or age component relevant to that. It is the news that matters, and um, just to, to add, or on the on the picture or the visual side, the visual has to have a relevance to the story and add to the story. That is very important. I mean, it is very hard. For instance, if you have or an algorithm or to visualize that, or or if you talk about space situation awareness, or um, in your in your project, how want to how do you want to visualize that? Um, but there are, there are ways around. I mean, it is a relevance that matters and not the gender nor the age, in my opinion. Okay, um, for her, yeah. Yeah, for her, it's not a criteria, uh, but you know, everyone loves stories uh, that, that shows like the underrepresented people. So. Um, and you know, it, sometimes it, you can also like work around that to like select the topic of uh, the title of your article. Maybe trying to like, uh, for example, maybe there is a team of engineers that develop satellites with the majority of the women. Um, you know, there are ways you can um, you can bring out that kind of information. Uh, maybe in the title of the articles. And stuff like that. Uh, for for us, we. Even in the past, we've tried to like uh, run initiatives to, for example, support uh, women's participation in the African space industry, providing scholarship, uh, you know, for them to um, attend international conferences and all. Um, so this is also one of the ways that we try to uh, showcase that. Thanks, Tamidayo. Okay, I'll move on to the next question, which we have from Katrina is what makes up a great interview? How do you prepare them? And what makes a speaker interesting? So I believe we had a lot of advice on how to make, um, how to prepare, um, make sure to take photos, make sure to keep diary. We have a lot of advice on that, but is there another way to make sure that your story shines out from the other ones? So may I ask all three of you, maybe, I don't know, Otavia, you can start. Um, that's something I already mentioned on my presentation, but I think I will say it again, the human interest aspect I think is very important. So how do you feel personally about your project? Why is it important to you and how is it going to make a difference? Who is going to be the beneficiary? What is it going to achieve? So really focusing on the ultimate goal of the of the project so not just we're going to put a satellite in orbit but for example we're going to use the data from the satellite to i don't know improve water management in in our country um, so try to get to the bottom of what you're trying to achieve and also try to use simple and clear language this would be my advice to make your story stand out Thanks, Otavia. Torsten, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, sure. I'm, I'm not sure if that sure. the question was referenced to the interviews uh, we do in the Space Caf Cafe, uh, but um, they are definitely not stand-up uh, interviews, so they are prepared and are, I mean, it's A, the question, and I absolutely second what, what Octavia just, just mentioned. So, um, but how do we pick our, our speakers? So I'm just approaching those people and, and invite them to or the space cafes and, and we talk or in our pre-talks about what they would like to address. And then we, we shape these, uh, these dialogues 
are around that. So it's it's not scripted, but it is prepared. And I think that's are very, very important if you have a short period of time and we use a 33 minute format, you want to bring it to the point. So there is no time for too much blurb right and left. So uh, you, you want to get your message uh, down. Then our, on, the, uh, on the other format on our podcasts, um, our host is looking for interesting folks from the from the space industry. So to tell the story behind this project, so to tell the human story. Um, the, the last one again um, is uh, was with um, Jim Schwartz, um, a space, space philosopher from the Wichita University in the US. And we talked with him about really what does it mean to settle on our a new population or on the moon. Um, so what other aspects than the technical aspects come into play and should we everything do what we are able to do? So more these philosophical uh, aspects. And I think that makes it interesting. Um, this, this, this makes the unique story behind. So and yes, all the interviews, if you're are, uh, and it's the same for a written interview or an, um, an audio interview or video interview, they have to be prep proper prepared. Thank you, Timidayo. Do you have any points from your uh, side? Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes interviews are, you know, are, are organized as like a follow up to an activity. So, for example, now you've launched a satellite and, you know, to trying to interview you to talk about the project and all of that. Uh, one of the ways to actually do well in the interviews is, you know, sharing information that are not already hard. So, for example, if you're interviewed on a subject and everything you're saying in the interviews are things that are already like in the public domain, then, you know, there is nothing interesting in that because there is nothing new one is getting from the interview. Um, so it's all about, you know, paying attention to details and uh, providing like relevant new information. Um, you know, one of the ways that we try to, you know, get people to be calm during interviews is we try to actually share, you know, some questions with them before the interview. So, uh, you know, the information that you need, maybe you need to gather some data uh, in order to answer certain questions and all that. But in general, it's all about, you know, providing relevant new information uh, that, you know, the readers will be happy um, to come across. Thanks, Tamidayo. Okay, um, we have another question. So for covering the whole world, um, it might be interesting to publish the same news several times in different times, or is it effective to do it once, like a really big one once, or I understand there's a lot of time differences, there's many areas that you want to cover is there any advice you have for when to publish it or it, like how many times you should publish it or use different medias at different timings or is there anything you have to advise on that um maybe you can start with torsten sure um is, is that a story is not getting better as, as more often you publish that um so that's very important. So if you have your story and you define when you are um, published that a on your website or on whatever media you choose, it is a channel that matters. Um, I mean, the, the website ultimately is the the place where you store it or, or you you write it up and you store it, and then you promote your story and then you do that that you do then on Twitter on um, whatever LinkedIn potentially Facebook, Instagram or whatever channels you might might use. I mean, uh, um, Telegram became very popular, um, WhatsApp groups and so on. But there you can do that more often and reference to your story um, because there is no perfect timing for the entire world. Um, I mean, just mentioned yesterday at or at 4 p.m. when I've done my, my space cafe with Malcolm or Davis, it was 2 a.m. in Australia. So it's not a very com comfortable time for him in Australia. So uh, if you want to promote your story, yeah, 
think about um, a good structure for you and time it. I mean, all of these those, these media channels can be timed uh, and and prepared. Again, that goes back then to your media strategy or your com campaign management, if you want to see it that way. Thanks, um, Tammy Dio. Can we have advice from you? Uh, yes, I think I've actually addressed this question in the comment session. Um, so one of the ways you can decide this is to look at where, you know, uh, majority of your followers are from. Uh, so let's say you're on the Twitter account and majority of your followers are, uh, are in Europe. And then you only have like few followers, in maybe America um, and maybe Asia and all of that. So you can, you know, make the tweets around the period when the people in Europe will be awake. Um, you know, not like when they are sleeping. So, so when you make the tweet at that period, they can interact with it, and then by the time people in America are coming online, your tweet already has a lot of retweets and likes, and it's almost trending. Um, and then they can just join the trend. So you can start by, so for us in space in Africa now, I mean we tweet all day, uh, but at night, majority of our followers at night that's Lagos time. Majority of our followers are actually online. Um, so when we make tweets, we get like lots of retweets and likes in the night compared to when we do that in the day. Because in the day, um, you know, a lot of people in um, in Europe, uh, you know, they, maybe they're just going to work or just trying to set down at a walk, and people don't really have time for social media at that period. Um, and then the people in America are, you know, trying to go to bed at that period. But in the evening, people in Europe and Africa, they're done with the day's work. They're just trying to like, you know, relax and then they have time for social media. And the people in America are just waking up. So, you know, all of this combined together gives us like better impression. And so you don't need to like make multiple tweets of the same thing. Uh, you just need to like look at the period where um, majority of your... The, the other ways you can do this is by using some of these... Uh, free tools that you can use to uh, to schedule tweets uh, or to schedule your, like the social media. So uh, an example is Crowd, Crowdfire Hub. So Crowdfire Hub, uh, if, you, if you post on Crowdfire Hub, it will ensure that your post goes out around the period when people mostly interact with your tweet uh, or with whatever you're posting on any social media. So this is automated. You just like schedule the tweet and it goes out when, um, you know, using like data analytics and all of that, they know when majority of your audience will likely interact with your post and then uh, you can use that to schedule. So uh, that, that's what I would recommend. Thank you, Octavia. Do you have anything um, to add? I think this is very comprehensive what we heard. I just wanted to add regarding live events, for example, this webinar that we're doing today, as you know, we are doing two, two sessions. One is this one and one in the afternoon. And that is to facilitate people from different uh, time zones to participate. So in context where live participation matters, such as yeah, a webinar when you want live interaction, then yes, you might consider doing it twice. Otherwise, as Timmy Dio and Torsten said, yes, the story, the value of the story matters more than the time and uh, you can post and then if the post is trending on social media, people in other time zones, they will see it anyway when they come online. So I think the repeating the content is more important for, for live events, obviously. Thanks, Otavia. One more advice I'd like to hear from all of you is about multilingualism. So um, to reach the effective people, um, I think Otavia mentioned that you can not only do it in English, but to reach the, that specific local community, you can use other languages as well. Um, is there any advice you have regarding language? Um, um, Octavia. Yeah, we can start. Um, yes, it's important to consider which language your audience prefers. 
And um, it's also important, if you can, to keep it up because sometimes one, one, just one word of cautioning that I will say here is if you only post in Spanish once, for example, and then you don't keep it up, um, maybe it's not ideal. So before you launch into multilingualism, I think you also need to consider whether you can keep the effort up going forward. But yes, it's always good to consider different languages, not just to stick to English and to align your use of languages with those that your audience uses. And you can check, actually, you can check this through Twitter analytics and Facebook analytics. You can see there uh, which is the main languages language that your audience interacts with. So that's a good check to do. Thank you. Um, Timmy Dio, do you have anything to add on this? Uh, yes. So, you know, one of one of our recent experiences around this was uh, we wrote an article about a company in Africa called Astrofica. It's based in South Africa. Uh, and then it got the attention of uh, people in Italy. So I, I think the name actually means uh, some vulgar word in Italy. And, you know, the, the, the article just blew up, the tweet blew up. And people were retreating from Italy trying to make jokes around it and all of that. Um, now, around language, I think you can just focus on the language that you're familiar with. So if you're like um, a company based in an English speaking country, you can, you know, focus on English. Uh, most of the social media pages have some sort of algorithm uh, that can translate these, uh, you know, your posts to like other languages and make it accessible to people, um, you know, instead of uh, for example, and then if you're not like, you know, a native language, uh, a native speaker of the language you're trying to, uh, you know, you might end up like, if you're using, for example, Google Translate to like, you know, get the translation in other languages, it, it might end up not being uh, appropriate and it, it might affect your brand. So I would say stick to the language you, uh, you're you familiar with. It doesn't matter, people are still going to, you know, interact with your tweets. Thank you, Tamidayo. Torsten. I think language is, or from, from the story side, just another parameter um, that you have to consider. Um, it's, it's like the timing and so on. So it is what is the message you want to distribute and where? Where's your audience? I mean, if you're a company based in Germany and your market is Germany and you're looking for German investors. So what is the value of or uh, pushing an, a message out in English or in an American time zone? So and again, you have to consider what what you want to reach with your with your message. Um, English is the common language in the space sector. So if you want to reach out to a global audience, if you want to um, make people globally aware of you, then in my opinion, there's no other way to do it in English. Um, every every other language you might consider depends on your, where your target, where your audience is located that you want to reach. Thank you so much, Torsten. Yeah, I think we had different answers from all the speakers and they were all very interesting. Okay, to wrap up, um, I'm going to ask the speakers to, in one sentence, give us your final thoughts, final message about how to effectively raise awareness about your project in our applications that we ask for. So we ask them for a, a plan to raise awareness and just one sentence, one last advice would be great. So if I can start with Timmy Dayo. Yeah, um, so, you know, if you get into this uh, program, uh, the media are going to come after you. Uh, you're going to gain a lot of attention. And if you do it right, uh, you know, it might be the best thing to happen to your project. So I would say just, you know, pay attention to some of the things that you've gotten today and, uh, you know, in representing your brand very well and uh, everything should be fine. Uh, we look forward to receiving, you know, your press releases and all of that in space in Africa. Uh, and we will be happy to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Temidayo Torsten. 
Sure. Um, I just can or second what or Timida you just just mentioned. So be authentic, be trustful, be transparent, and be yourself. That is the these are for me the, the most valuable ingredients when you um, place your story, when you reach out or to programs or to 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 media. Um, and yeah, again, um, also from my end, if we can help you, reach out to us. That's it. I mean, there is no one answer that fits all. Very easy. Thank you, Torsten and Octavia from our office. From my side, I would say two things. Um, tell us why it matters. How is your project making a difference? Why should people care about it, including people who don't know much about the space sector? And also give us actions that we can take to engage with your, pro with your project. So give people opportunities such as participate in a webinar, check your website, read your story, come to your lecture, anything that you can offer people to be a part of your project, to interact with what you're doing is good.